Okay, thank you, thank you, Kai, for the introduction. All right, so um, I want to start by thanking the organizers for for making this possible. And it's my first, I guess, mathematical trip after all this horrible time. And it's actually a, 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 a good pleasure to be here in the, at the Hauser Institute and also to be kind of getting back to do mathematics with people in, in person. So I think that's, that's important for, for all of us. Okay, so um, since I'm using the Blackboard, I really write some of the stuff so that is is ready for you. So I'm gonna discuss today some joint work with uh, Juan Jose Marin and Dorina, Irina and Marius Mitrea, and of course myself, which is the the fifth M in this in this power. And then um, this is a, a joint project that became actually a book that is about to be to be finished. And the what what we do in, in this in this book is to to consider the theory of ledger potentials on, on unbounded domains. So I'll, I'll explain this in a in a moment, but I wanna this this the name the name of this program and the and the conference is about interaction. So I've also included the word extrapolation, which is also another interaction with with harmonic analysis or real real analysis. Okay, so I'm gonna start um, kind of uh, general, and then I'll I'll start uh, putting some details. So I'm gonna work in. In our M plus one, this is going to be a domain in our M plus one. For the moment, we are not, I'm not um, assuming anything on the domain, it will come later. And then I want to write the derivative problem in some kind of a general way. So let X be your favorite space of functions. And I'm going to be working with non smooth functions. So that means you see, you can consider also the C alpha problems or. Uh, I don't know, trivial or can say like that, but you see, I'm really working with non-smooth functions. For instance, spaces like LP or maybe weighted LP, or even like Lorentz Loren spaces or or orless spaces, or these kind of spaces that contain uh, functions which are not as smooth. And I'm going to take L, which is going to be elliptic operator or, or system, is going to be constant complex coefficients. So. But for most of the talk, I will be working with the Laplacian. Okay, but but the idea is that uh, this layer potential theory is strong enough to be carried out uh, in the case of of more general objects, right? So what is the Dirichlet problem? The Dirichlet problem consists in in solving, finding solutions, and maybe decide whether they are unique or not of this. So you compute L of u equals zero. Because my coefficients are constant, this is going to be solutions are going to be classical. They're going to be C infinity. So when I look for classical solutions, whose non-tangential malfunction uh, is in the space X, and whose boundary trace is in the non-tangential function is also in the in the space X. So this is what what is the Dirichlet problem with on X. So what is this non-tangential function? So if you are in the domain, you have some structure. So then you, you can define some kind of cons and the non-tangential maximal function is the supreme one of the solution within, within the con, okay? And the non-tangential trace is the same thing, but now um, you take the limit only within this region, okay? All right, and you see cons have different angles, but I, don't, I will not pay attention to that. You, sometimes you do you know something for one angle, you know it for, for another one. Okay, so this is, um, the, the question that I want to consider is when is this problem well posed? And well posed means well posed means two things: whether uh, and things can be independent, right? So, in principle, we may consider whether there is a solution for this problem, and also if there are more than two solutions, if the solution is unique, if there is only one solution, and sometimes. But not always, you can always consider a different question, which is whether you have some kind of continuity with respect, you have this, what we call bounds, okay? But in principle, we'll pose that doesn't need to include this. So this is typically typically an extra bit that will be also uh, true in, in, this, in this context. Okay, so this is, I guess, 
uh, boundary value problems. The domain for the moment is boundary of Madden. I don't, I don't mind. I haven't introduced layer potentials, but and I haven't introduced what is extrapolation. So let me put here what is extrapolation and then why do you want to put extrapolation in something which is a PDE problem? Okay, so extrapolation, but by extrapolation, I mean Rubio de Francia extrapolation, which is a very powerful result that says the following. Suppose you are given some operator. It doesn't even have to be a linear, sublinear. It's just a very, very general object. And you know that this operator maps L2 of W into L2 of W for every weight in A2. What is a weight, and this is in some kind of special homogeneous state, a weight is in A2 if, let's put it in Rn for the moment, If you take the average, the average of Q of W on Q, and then you take the average of Q of the inverse of the reciprocal, and they take the supremum, and this is infinity. So this says that there is a balance. The cube cannot be too, too large or too small because there should be a balance between these objects. So you have an operator, your favorite operator, a little bit fairly or score function, a singular integral, the risk transfer, whatever. And then you know that for some reason that this is bounded on L2. So what the extrapolation says is that this automatically implies the same thing for all P's and for all weights in AP. So you extrapolate because from one single exponent and all weights, you end up having all the exponents and all weights. Okay, this is a this is kind of like a very strong result, and it's in a sense kind of like a magical result, right? Because how in the world, just having one exponent, you can get everything almost for free, right? I'll, I'll explain in a, in a moment the way that I understand this thing. Of course, I haven't said what is the weight in AP. The weight in AP is similar. So the condition that you have to put is this one, where P prime is the conjugate exponent of P, okay? The special, it's not that important why an, a weight in A2 is this condition or not. What is important about A2 weights is that they characterize the boundedness of the hard variable maximal function. So a weight is in AP for P greater than one, if and only if the hard variable maximal function maps LPW into L. And that's what is needed. So in a sense, extrapolation is not about ways that satisfy some condition. It's about a collection of, you have a big collection of objects on which the maximal operator is budget. So somehow you have so much information when you know that something happens for every way for which the maximal operator is bonded that you can recover a, a lot of a lot of estimates. Okay. And this is a Ruby French extrapolation theorem in, in on its classical on its classical form, but there are there have been some kind of uh, developments and you can actually prove like a lot of uh, estimates in many, many spaces. For instance, I can put Lorentz spaces. And then in this case, for instance, I have to put weights in AP. I can put uh, Orlis spaces. And again, AP. I can put for some people that like the variable LP spaces whenever I put some conditions so that the maximal operator, so the maximal operator essentially has to be bounded in here. Because at the end of the day, as I said before, this is about the boundedness of the maximal operator. So that is why I put here this in, in very general terms, because one thing that you can do and happen many times in PD is that you do a, a space at a time, right? So you first prove it for LP and then you do it, or let's do it for, maybe another class of operators, and then you kind of repeat the arguments. While somehow extrapolation is telling you that maybe you can find a mechanism to show that from one boundary value problem, much as you got here for an operator, you can get this for this boundary value problem. So my idea here is to present a mechanism to say that basically we're gonna say is we are gonna do this 
for all weights in A2, and then we're going to get many X. It, on the boundary, it's on the boundary, on the boundary because this is where the space, this is where the space of homogeneous type is. For, yes, yes, for the moment I didn't put any condition, but it will come later, okay? But it's, it's gonna be, how do I have many properties, okay? So the idea here is to use the layer potential theory, and it's not surprising because layer potentials are Calderon Sigmund operators, which in a sense satisfy this kind of condition. So at the end, everything goes back to the singular interval. Okay. So this is somehow the this is somehow the this is somehow the idea of the of the whole thing, and this is how extrapolation comes. And then my goal is going to be to first consider this problem, and then just show the mechanism to so. And the idea is that you can extrapolate the boundary value problem. What I mean is that. It's not only about the bounds. You can you can see okay maybe it's about the bounds because you extrapolate. No, no, you can extrapolate the system. You can extrapolate uniqueness. So if you know existence for all these spaces, then you know existence here, and so it's the same for for uniqueness. So that's the magic of that's the magic of extrapolation. Okay, so now I think I haven't I put everything on the board with the exception of what is ledger potentials. So for the ledger potentials, I'm gonna consider the Laplacian because this is much simpler. And then I'm gonna, and then I, I don't know if I will have time to consider other operators, but anyway, the idea is the same. So I'm gonna put the, what is called the double ledger, the, which is an operator of the following form. I'm gonna put it in, in F plus. Okay. Of course, you see the first thing. The first thing that I need is to assume that there is some a unit normal. So let's suppose that there is a unit normal in a, a theoretical measure way. Okay. So this is what is called the, and this is an operator that is for x in the domain. So this is what is called the double ledger uh, boundary to domain. The integration is on the boundary, so y is here and x is here, right? So whenever this is well-defined, so you need maybe this function to be nice enough so, so that this is absolutely convergent. And let me notice that there is no singularity here. There is no singularity because your point Y is on the boundary and your point X is in the domain. So there is always distance. So this is, you see, if your F is reasonable, it doesn't grow that, that much, this is gonna be absolutely, uh, the internet is gonna be absolutely convergent, right? So this is well-defined. And because this is well-defined, for instance, you can compute this object because, and then you can actually bring this inside and then what you bring inside, this is with respect to the variable X, would you have to, to take derivative with this guy with respect to X? And then this happens to be harmonic. So for any function, and let me now get to, this is true for any, for any G which is reasonable. Okay. So what this is saying, that this is a mechanism to construct solutions. So you give me a good G and I can find a solution to this problem. And actually not only that, when I say this, this is again, this is gonna be C infinity in the domain. Because again, you see, you can bring all the derivatives inside of us. Okay? So if you think about the problem, this is gonna be a good candidate for the, for the solution. So the idea is to say, okay, let's put this with a generic G, I keep the F for the data, and then let's see what I need to assume on, or what is gonna be my, my G so that this, this the equation is satisfied. Okay. Um, all right, so this means that uh, if I'm gonna take you, and this is the, what I need to find, right? So in particular, this means that I have to see what is the behavior of, of this operator as you approach the boundary. Okay, and this is now where things start getting now complicated because here, 
when my x is in the domain and y is in here, there is always distance on the, the, the operator is not, is, doesn't have a singularity. But if I take x approaching to the boundary, now there are gonna be, the operator becomes singular. So now, now this operator becomes something that is problematic, right? So we have to be careful. So we can introduce the, say the limit of the, or, or say, the same operator, but now taking place in the boundary. But now I have to put a principal value because I have a singularity. When I say principal value, it means that maybe I have to take one minus s greater than epsilon and take the limit of epsilon goes to zero. And now I need the principal value because your y is in here and your x is in here. So your x is on the boundary. So now, so now it's not even clear when I say this is this well, this is, this is well defined whenever f is reasonable, but now having this well defined or not as becoming problematic, right? So, so, um, but let me observe the following is that you can think that this is the kernel, but if you think that this is the kernel, then this is a variable kernel in y and x. And then maybe the regularity on the y variable is problematic, right? Because you don't know whether the unit number is problematic, but you can do the following stupid trick, which is say, okay, let me expand this. So what I can see this is just a sum over j one to n plus one, yj minus xj, y minus x and plus one. I can see this way. And now this would be familiar. So this is actually the kernel of the risk transform. And then what you think is you put this together with this because this is a harmless number which has normless than one, modulus than one, right? So what you can see is that this operator if reasonable is almost like a sum of risk transforms acting on, on G multiplied by the, by the unit normal. So if you need this operator to be well-defined or you need this operator to be bounded, you need the risk transform to be bounded, right? So the first thing that I'm gonna put on the, as assumption is that I'm gonna need that my boundary is UR. If the boundary is UR, we know that all singular integral operators with, with odd kernels, which this is the prototype, right? Are gonna be bounded on L2. So if this is UR, for instance, we're gonna have that, and on top of that, I have some kind of well-defined unit normal, which I didn't, I didn't mention why, but anyway, this is gonna be, for instance, bounded in L2 in L2. And once it is bounded on L2, automatically you get, all P's and maybe all weighted LP's because this is the Calderon Sigma theory, right? So once you know that a singular integral operator is in this boundary in L2, there is a Calderon Sigma theory, which is also extrapolation result, right? So you start with P plus two and then you saw a number of spaces and then you get these spaces, right? So, and not only that, and this, this principal value exists and, and things like that, okay? But then how is this related to the behavior of the boundary? So this is, So this fundamental work of, of Homa Mitria Taylor in which in very general conditions, what they saw is that uh, when you take or a reasonable function, you take the boundary trace and resist it to the boundary, then you get one half plus Ka, one half identity plus Ka. Uh, uh, almost sigma, almost everywhere. So this is how this, this relates. So you don't quite get this operator, which is what you may be naively think, or maybe from this operator you go to this, there is some jump at the boundary, which is this half identity. Okay? So under general conditions, we know that this is, and now, now this is where we can remember that I still need to think what is gonna be my, my G. And just knowing how is this at the boundary, I can now use the last, bit of information on my problem. So now what I say, okay, I need to take G so that 
one half identity plus k a of g is equal to f. So if you are able to find a g uh, satisfying this, then you are done. And this is what the ledger potential is about, right? Um, uniformly rectifiable, and I guess you are going to need also to have a, to have a unit normally where it's defined. So typically, um, you need to have like the um, theoretical measure, measure boundary at least with the, so this, this kind of, of things related this and this, right? So you need this to be defined almost everywhere. And then you also, you cannot, for instance, you cannot have things like that because here there's no unit normal. Right, so you need to have something kind of qualitative information about the interior of the So I'm gonna, in my case, uh, these things are gonna come. For instance, if the domain is NTA, that for sure is true, but there is, is actually more. Um, I guess it's NTA, in a sense, it's kind of like almost like NTA. There is some local jump condition and things like that. Okay, but there, there are things more in general with, with that. Well, some of this more recent. Yeah. Go, more general, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they go more general, yeah. But in that case, I guess that maybe you don't have the, all the boundedness in L2, right? Maybe you have only or not. No. Yeah. Okay, for the system, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, all, it's for the, yeah, and once the Calderon Simon theory, what you have L2, you have the rest. And I, I and I don't know. Also, Marius has this kind of divergence. This this group, this book about divergence theorem, which is supposed to be one thousand pages, something like that. Which I think that maybe they do kind of general things. <laughs> almost, almost two thousand. Oh shit! <laughs> oh well, he's a productive guy. Okay, so. This is now the, pro the question. So for instance, if you wanna say that I wanna solve the deleted problem, say in L2, what I need to know is whether this operator is invertible on the space L2. Or if you wanna put LP, you need to solve. So, so the heart of the problem of the ledger potential is that everything now becomes about the invertibility of some operator. And the question is when this operator is invertible. Right. So the other day, Michalis gave a talk, and then he basically said, "You see, and this is actually even one of the questions in Kenneth's book, right? So you want to use ledger potential, you want to also this invertible. The regularity problem is also, in a sense, some kind of invertibility in some sense, right? Okay. So um, let me now. So we started at ten fifteen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh well. <laughs> no more. Oh, well, don't let me. Don't tell me that. <laughs> okay. So let me. Maybe I'm gonna erase this and continue here. So, so you see now the question is when. Or how can you show that the this operator is invertible in some space, uh, whatever space is your favorite space, right? So there is now so in this. In this work of Homometria Taylor, what they consider was the bounded case. And what they, they obtain is a class of operators, or it's a class of domains on which these operators are invertible. These are what is called uh, SKT domains. Or more in general, delta SKT domains. I'll, I'll get this in a minute. So, SKT is from Semskenic Toro, and there are some domains I don't want to put on the conditions because they are kind of technical, but the main idea is that the unit normal is smooth 
in some in some sense. So the model, because it's a boundary operator, is the unit ball, right? So you think of the of the unit ball and, and the and the unit normal. So you for instance see here that mu is C1, right? And actually this goes back to the to the to the work of Fesh Rivier Jodite, right? Fesh Jodite Rivier, uh, on which they actually kind of develop this theory assuming that your unit normal has some kind of regularity in a, a continuous sense. But here, the point is like this is too restricted, so they actually do it with in a more in a more general general way. So what they show is that if you have some kind of smoothness in some sense, then this operator is compact. And this is something some concept in in function analysis. Don't I'm not going to get into that. Um, and what happened with compact operators? The compact operators are good if you want to invert an operator because this is an invertible operator, of course, the identity is invertible. And then if you have an invertible operator but something that is compact, then you get something that is almost compact. Sorry, 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 yes. It's almost invertible, invertible with the exception of maybe finite dimensional set, finite dimensional spaces. This is the what is called the flat form theory. So part of this thing is you saw that the operator is compact, then you get that this is flat horn within the zero, then you saw that it is injective, and then flat horn from the zero invertible means surjective, and then this is the invertibility. Say it again. Does this relate, does this relate directly to converging unit hormones to two subjects? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but up there, that's it, right? You, you said three chance one. You know, just some of the no, 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 no. I'll, I'll get this in a moment. Okay. So, so no, 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 no. I'll get this. Actually, this is an important point because if I see the operator for some of the risk transform, then you get into trouble. Okay, okay so I'll, I'll get this in a moment. So, so, okay, so. So in a, in, in a sense, one, one can think that in terms of invertibility, compact operators are small because this is, you can think that this is like a small perturbation of an invertible operator. So the question is, um, what is the example of, um, typically compact operators are operators with a, weak, with a weaker singularity. So how can you get a weaker singularity? And the idea is the following. Remember that I said before that you can write the operator as a sum of risk transform, but this destroys in a sense the algebra of the, of the kernel, right? So if I wanna consider this operator, actually I need to look at the kernel as, a, as, a, as this object. So this is now the kernel and you have to keep it together because what is the idea? The idea is just to look at the following. So you have your Y here and then you have your X here, right? So you are, computing the inner product between this vector and this vector. So somehow infinitesimally, this is gonna be a small. So the idea is that you're gonna have like a, you gain cancellation. And this is what gives you the, this is what gives you the, which is what gives you the, the compactness. But somehow for this, this is where you need some kind of regularity of the kernel, because if, if your unit normal is kind of have a lot of oscillation, it's very regular, then you don't gain this, this, this regularity. Okay, so what is this regularity that they put? So they put is that um, this belongs to the space BMO. BMO, remember, I think it came uh, before, so then you take, over all x on the boundary, all s is smaller than r. Uh, so this is VMO. So VMO is you take an average, you take this, it's like the VMO norm, but now you restrict it to up to size r. And then you, you look how this behaves, what that goes to see. So this is VMO. More in general, they are able to do this 
by, and this is what is gonna be a delta SKT domain, which is on which maybe this is not, the operator is not compact, it's maybe close to a compact operator. And then because this is kind of, a, the unit normal is not in VMO, but it's close enough to VMO. And then maybe you can solve the problem in maybe some space time, I feel like. Okay, so the main the main feature here is about the uh, is about the regularity, the smoothness, or the oscillation of the unit normal. This is about how how is the oscillation of the unit normal. Okay, so the question is what happened when you were working with unbounded domains? You could try to repeat to repeat this, but then there is a problem with compactness and with the Fredholm theory. Compactness is something about compact, compact things are bounded. So when you try to do compactness in unbounded domains, then the situation is not, you don't expect to have these operators to be compact. Because if you need to have something compact um, in an unbounded domain, probably you're gonna need some decay at infinity. And maybe whether you're gonna have some decay at infinity. So the methods are simply not available. Right, so the theory stops here. There is, if you wanna be okay, I wanna do an unbounded domain. This theory is, is not available. So the question is, okay, but it's still legitimate to uh, study operator, and it's still a question whether this is invalid. So let's look again. For bound that I have invertible plan plus compact, and it works fine, but. What can I do here? Again, it's also, you can think as a perturbation thing, right? This is invertible. If I saw that this is a small as an operator, then I can use the Neumann series. So that's the question. The question is that maybe we don't know here, we don't have a smallness, but maybe we can find a way to find some kind of a smallness of this operator. And in that case, then maybe I can show the invertibility. But of course, this is just the intuition, but let's, probably it's better to look at an example to see whether this is plausible, right? So what is the prototype of a modern operator? If for a modern operator we have the ball, for a modern operator is the half space, right? So suppose that my, my domain now is the half space. So let's look at this kernel. And again, much as I said before, if I break this operator for some of the risk transfer, I lose the information. So I need to keep all this together. So what is this? So now I have Y is in here, X is in here, and this is the unit normal. So this kernel is identically zero, right? Because in this case, the unit normal is constant. And then precisely, you see, you have Two orthogonal, two orthogonal vectors, right? So this is zero. So this means that the operator is zero. This is it. So of course, if the operator is zero, this is invertible, right? So now it's natural to think, okay, maybe what I have to do is something like that. In this case, I know that in my model case, I have something which the operator is zero. So Maybe if I look for examples on which I can gain some smallness of this, of this kernel so that when I prove my estimates, I obtain that the operator has a small norm, then I'll be done. Okay, and this is the idea. This is the idea of the, this is the idea of the, of what we have done. Okay, so let me. Okay. All right, so. Let me observe that in this case, the VMO norm is identically zero because there is no oscillation at all. VMO is not the right space here because VMO is about infinitesimal behavior. And we know that in a bunch of things, infinitesimal is not enough, right? So what we are gonna do is to assume that this number is small. So somehow 
we are gonna think that if this in the VM or norm is small, we can prove something for the, for the operator. Okay, and actually this is one of the results that we prove is that Actually, we prove it, say, maybe, like, let me put A2. Happens in any, so you, you think, sorry, let's put it without words. So for instance, we prove it. We prove it once we have it for L2, even by interpolation, by many things, you can prove it. Right, so actually we prove that if you assume under some conditions, and I'll put the condition in a moment, you can actually show that the, the double layer, the boundary to boundary double layer is controlled by this, which uh, this is kind of uh, first time you see maybe it's a scary situation because you know, oh, if, they, if the unit normal is constant, then the operator has to be zero, but it's actually the unit normal is constant only when you have a upper, upper space. So in principle, this is kind of disagrees with this behavior. And then when we have this, then we can use an Neumann series to invite. Okay. So this is the this is the philosophy because now, so once we have this, if you assume that this is much as right, if you assume that there is a number and you assume that this is smaller than one half, so now you have a formula for this inverse, the inverse of this operator, right? Which is uh, two to the negative one. No, 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 I'm not saying, I'm not gonna say what is, there is some value because you see, I, maybe with P equals two, we can calculate that. Yeah. It's gonna be depending on the dimension and maybe, maybe depends on the ADR. I don't remember exactly the, the number, but there is some some theta that kind of comes around because it is through a good line that this is the bit same decomposition, things like that. So then, This is your inverse, right? So you use the Neumann series and this is the inverse of the operator. And when you have the inverse of the operator, the ledger method kind of goes through and then you get the, the solution, okay? So that's the idea. So now let me be more precise. Um, and now let me say what is what are the kind of domains that we consider. Okay, so. So we say that in our definition, which is maybe a little bit different to the definition before, because it's in the case of a model. So of course we assume that the binary is ADR. To say the local John is being able to get to the boundary using on the initial path from two sides, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put that. And then a unit normal is smaller than that. Right? So this is the definition. But with these things, you can actually get some, uh, some, some extra geometric information. Provided delta is sufficiently small, it's not really, really small, but it's small that some dimensional constant, things like that. This domain is gonna be refember flat. It's gonna be two-sided NTA. And something is kind of surprising is that Both the domain and the and the exterior domain and open and bounded connected. So basically, you are having something that divides the space into, and also. The boundary has to be connected. So just assuming this, you get a lot of topology in a sense, right? So believe it or not, this is not, uh, assuming things that you can think of, oh, maybe this is, this happens for a lot of examples. That's not quite true, right? So assuming that the unit normal oscillates as more than some number kind of puts a lot of constraints into, into the domain. For instance, you cannot have something like that. You may think, oh, maybe this is a very nice 
domain because because you see this is everything is smooth. No, no, this is not good for this thing because the unit normal is not going to be smaller than delta. Actually, under very general conditions, um, one can think, oh, maybe I can do the same thing for bounded domain. So the question is that if the domain is bounded, then BMO norm of the unit normal agree with the L infinite norm, right? So this in particular says that when, if you just look the, the reciprocal, this says that this has to be unbounded. So just assuming that it's a smaller than one, just so that the, the boundary has to be unbounded. So in particular, now both the domain and the exterior has to be unbounded, of course, okay? Okay, yeah. No, 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 it has to be, it has to be a, well, you see, of course, the to say the local John is forcing to, is forcing you to have an empty, no, it cannot be an empty exterior. But and if you have an empty exterior, you have a problem defining the unit normal, right? Unless maybe this is the whole set on which there is nothing. <laughs> assuming no, assuming, but in, you know, if you know connectivity, have not connectivity, then there has to be exterior. So it has like it has exterior, but assuming connectivity, but you can start with a domain. I guess that you see, even from the definition of the unit normal, the definition of the unit normal requires to have the kind of you see to have these things agree to no information from the side and the upside. Okay, um, right. So I think I have two minutes, and I don't know if it would be a laser. Oh, three minutes. Okay, then I, I can't relax. <laughs> All right, so the theorem, I'm gonna put it just with L2 of W. So this says that if given uh, omega in A2 of the boundary, if omega delta is KT, with delta sufficiently small, depending on the characteristic of the weight and things like that, then this problem is well posed. Well posed plus bounds, okay? And, of, and I say that it is led, but you can, we can also prove regularity, Neumann, transmissions, we do a number of things. So let me get back to extrapolation. Because remember that I wanted to say that from L2, I wanna pass to general spaces. So this is, this is the following version. This is the sharp, sharper extrapolation. It's no longer about operators, it's about embedding of a function. So give me a weight in AP and give me two functions in AP, sorry, in LP of W, P between one and infinity. Okay, so what the extrapolation in hindsight said is the following. You can find a weight that depends on F and G. So this is a completely nonlinear thing. So that the following things happen. Uh, this is a constant that depends on probably dimension, the P and the characteristic of the weight in a P was a supreme one that I put before or the boundedness of the maximal function. And I have the following thing, the norm of F in LP of W is controlled by some constant of the same, of the same depending on the same quantities, the norm of F in L to W. So uh, I should use, let me put here omega, oh, let me put here omega naught and I'm gonna put here omega. 
So I can control the LP norm of F by the L2 norm of W. And I can control the L2 norm of W by the LP norm of W. Okay? So it's like I'm having two functions and I'm able to embed quotes because this is not a real embedding because if depending on the function I find different depending on the two functions depends on different ways so I can put here a function take a function here so that this gets into here at the same time I can do it compatible with two functions so now for instance it's just one 50 seconds how do I show that maybe I have uniqueness suppose that I want to show uniqueness for oh, I don't have a space now Suppose that I want to show that this solution is, is identically zero. How do I proceed? So I just take in this theorem, the same, I can take the same function f and g, right? So given nu that I notice in LPW, I can find a new weight depending on, of course, depends on nu. So that if I put f equals g here, n of u, in LPW is a comparable to N of U, LPW, right? But if I have uniqueness for this problem, this implies, so I use the Dirichlet problem with this new weight in L2, and I saw that U has to be identically zero. And the same can be done for existence. And then I'm done. So then you can do this, all these spaces that I put before, Lorentz spaces, all these spaces, variable spaces, every, basically every space in which the maximal operator behaves well admits this kind of things. We can do Lame system of electricity, we can do complex systems, so we, we can do everything with complex constant coefficients, we can we can do it. This is the same, the same kind of approach. And now I'm done. Okay, thank you. Thank you.